seen the acute pain that executive policy has on families that live in our communities. But I also see it not just on the immigration side. I see it on the wage stagnation side. I see it on the lack of universal child care, the lack of universal health care. You know, we've got a lot of issues that need to be addressed that are not being addressed by our Congress, and we need to do better. One of the issues that I know you care a lot about is education. I believe your kids go to public schools and you also went to public schools. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you're planning to do if elected to improve education in the United States. Oh, sure. I I am definitely a product of public schools. In fact, one of the reasons I wanted to move back home is because I wanted my kids to go to the same public schools I attended, and they do. Public education is one of those things that we pay for together as a country that none of us can really afford alone individually. And public schools, a strong public school system is just as important as a really good national transportation system. You know, it's part of our domestic infrastructure. So uh, there are a few things that we need to do from my perspective as a parent. One, I don't think it's helpful to blame the teachers for everything when we're not investing in our public schools. You know, now we've decided that we have to do all of this testing, and it's really testing of the teachers. And I see it from my kids. It seems like every other week they're having some sort of standardized testing, and they're all stressed out about it. And when I was 11 years old, that's the age of my son, he's in fifth grade, I was never stressed out about standardized testing. And I see this in my kids, and I know the teachers Mm -hmm. get stressed out about it. And I'm not sure the standardized testing in the form that we currently have is doing what we want it to do. Mm -hmm. It's basically measuring a teacher's performance. So that needs to be revised. Two, I think it's really important that we emphasize teaching critical thinking skills. Mm -hmm. Teachers have to have the freedom in the classroom to engage with the students on the subjects that they're interested in, build that enthusiasm instead of worrying all the time about are they going to meet their measures for the standardized test. So there's a lot of work we need to do. Unfortunately, under the current administration, we're going in the wrong direction. So you mentioned that you're in Rockford. Could you talk a little bit about the 16th district? This is a very strange shape and a very enormous district. And I just now realized looking at a map that it actually touches my district. I live in the second district. So I'm in Chicago, but the second district goes down really far (laughs) down to Kankakee. And so it actually touches the 16th district, which is completely bizarre for anyone who knows anything about what an Illinois map looks like. So can you talk a little bit about the 16th district and and what it looks like? Sure. The 16th district is truly the head and heart of Illinois. We run from the Wisconsin border, skirt and curve all around Chicagoland to the Indiana border. So the largest city in the 16th is Rockford. Now Rockford is split in half between the 16th congressional district and the 17th. So we're a city not just divided by a river, but also by congressional districts. And at the southern end of the district, On the way down, you Ottawa's in the 16th, Dixon, DeKalb, and Morris, Illinois, and down at the southernmost part is Watsika. And it's three hours end-to-end, and I know that (laughs) because I travel it continuously. I think I've put over, I know I've put over 20,000 miles on my car from the primary (laughs) through uh, now the general. It's so strange to think of touching both Wisconsin border and Indiana border. (laughs) Well, it really is. It really is. And I actually grew up in the 16th Congressional District, but back then it ran pretty much the horizontal length of Illinois Mm. from Galena through McHenry County. So it it was a little bit less gerrymandered. So the 16th District, currently the representative is a Republican, Adam Kinziger, and I... Notice that in 2016, he ran unopposed. There wasn't (laughs) even a Democrat who ran in the race. And when he ran in 2014, he had 70% of the vote. 
So, you know, obviously, for the past couple of election cycles, this has been a very heavily Republican district. What do you see as your path to victory in this district? Well, that's a great question. And, you know, the thing that I love most about the people of the 16th district, of which I am one and have been for a very long time, is no one tells us who's going to represent us. And so while this district may have been drawn to favor Republicans, that doesn't mean a Democrat can't win. I am running a true grassroots campaign, which means, you know, I'm registering new voters and we're going to turn out all of the existing voters and we're going to spend all of our time talking about these bread and butter issues. You know, Mr. Kinsinger has been our representative for going on six years now, and I have not seen my life improve. I have not seen my community's strength grow because he's a true federal partner. And that's true throughout the district. You know, as I'm traveling around, what I get continually from people is we haven't seen him. There's a hashtag Mm -hmm. absentee Adam. You know, (laughs) he hasn't held a real town hall in more than five years. He turns away, literally turns away from constituents who want to ask him questions or share concern. That's not real representation. And I don't have any patience for it. And people in this district don't have any patience for it. So I live in Wisconsin, in Madison, but my husband works in Batavia, Illinois. And so he actually drives through the 16th district twice a week. And his name is also Adam. So as you were talking, I was thinking, hey, I think my Adam is in the district more than your actual (laughs) representative, Adam. 100% he is. I promise you. I promise you he is. You know, I... My view of the U.S. House of Representatives is, you know, it's a two-year term, right? And it's a two-year term because the House, those congressmen and women are supposed to be closest to the people they represent, which means they're supposed to come home. They're supposed to talk to their constituents. They're supposed to live in the districts. It's a very short term. You know, it's not supposed to be a career, even though that's what Congress has become. But when you turn it into a career and... We're electing people who are only concerned about the next campaign. We're not being represented. They're not working in our best interest. I mean, as an attorney, there's no way I could represent a client unless I talk to them. How can I advocate for their best interest if they don't tell me what it is? So we deserve someone that's going to listen to us. We deserve someone who's accessible, who's active and accountable. That's how I built my career. That's what I do for a living. And we deserve that in this district, regardless of political affiliation. I was looking at money and money raising in this district, and your opponent has an enormous amount of money uh, in his campaign war chest. So what is your strategy for campaigning, knowing that it's probably going to be impossible to raise as much money as he has raised? How, how do you work with that? How do you do sort of grassroots campaigning in ways that are more economically efficient? Well, I don't need to raise as much money as he has. I know that I can win this election on a lot less. I think most elections can be won on a lot less than we spend on them now. I'm raising money from as many individual contributors in district as possible. That's where my focus is. So I'm asking people to sign up for small monthly contributions. We've got 60,000 really good Democrats in this district, strong Democrats. If they all signed up for $5 a month now through November, that's $300,000 a month. That's a lot of money. Like everything else in this world, there's power in numbers and I think it's critically important that we start supporting candidates who are going to make a conscious effort to get more voters engaged in our process through volunteering, small dollar contributions. This has to become part of our process as voters. When we see a candidate we like in our district, it's our responsibility to support that candidate. And, you know, the people that are elected now all got there by raising huge sums of money from PACs from wealthy donors, it's not in their interest to change our election system to publicly finance campaigns. And I don't see that happening until we elect new people, people who actually live their values. And I believe very much in small dollar contribution. So that's what I'm doing with my campaign. And I, you know, I've raised the money that I need to pay for the things that I need to do. 
campaign should never be a money grab. And that seems to be what they've turned into. My opponent has raised most of his money from PACs. And of course, when you're an incumbent, Mm -hmm. you know, corporate PACs just send the money in. If you look, he's raised, he gets a lot of money from private insurance companies, healthcare insurance companies. And no wonder he voted to repeal the ACA. No wonder he voted for the tax plan that eliminated the individual mandate. I think that the representative needs to be accessible to the people that they represent, not the corporate interests. And I would ask anyone who believes that as well to consider making a contribution to my campaign. I think that's wonderful. And I want to point out that you were outraised and outspent by one of your primary opponents, and yet you won the primary by, it looks like a pretty huge margin. So money isn't everything. Money is not everything. You know, I guess it it might be the Scottish in me. I'm a McMurray (laughs) and my mother is a McQuinney. I'm pretty tight with my dollar and I like to get the best value for my dollar. And again, I'm not going to spend more than I need to, to accomplish what I need to accomplish. And that's how I run my law firm. And with the campaign, it's interesting. It's like starting a a small business that you know nothing about. And so I learned quite a bit during the primary and I'm taking those lessons and that knowledge with me into the general. So is there anything else that you would like to make sure that our listeners are thinking about as they're, they're thinking about your race for office? Yeah, I think it's really important that you know, I understand the frustration with from uh, the Republican base, uh, the people that voted for Trump. You know, in this district, Obama won in 2008. And a lot of those voters went and voted for Trump in 2016. And I get it. You know, it's the fact that our wages are not going up. You know, we're stagnant with our incomes. And we see less and less value for our tax dollar. So when I hear people say we're taxed too much, what I'm hearing is I'm not getting value for my tax dollar. And they're absolutely right. You know, the cost of health care is going up every year for employers and employees. Child care is ridiculously expensive. You know, you can spend $22,000 a year if you have two young children on child care per year. So even if you're making $50,000 a year, solidly middle class, between health care costs and child care costs, that's going to drop you to poverty level. So, of course, we're frustrated. The thing is, is we have to focus on those issues. When people talk about national security, I want to talk about domestic security. And that's what we need to focus on. And that's what I intend to do when I go to D.C. Excellent. And what is your website? SarahDady.com, S-A-R-A-D-A-D-Y.com. And you can also follow me on Facebook, Sarah Dady for Congress. Thanks for listening to Two Broads Talking Politics. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? off the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Imunari. And we're using it with express permission of the band. Our logo and all original artwork is by Matthew Wefflin and is done expressly for Two Broads Talking Politics. We can be found on our website at twobroadstalkingpolitics.com. You can reach us by email at twobroadstalkingpolitics at gmail.com, on Twitter at twobroadstalk, on Facebook and Instagram, and you can support us on patreon.com. You can find our podcast on Apple Podcast, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, and anywhere podcasts are found. If you are interested in advertising on Two Broads Talking Politics, please email us at twobroadstalkingpolitics at gmail.com.